All right, are we going to do those first uh, four yet? All right, thanks. Nicole's done. So if you're not done, I guess don't worry about it. You know, keep working. Well, we're going to go through these first four. Uh, so first, when bicarbonate acts as an acid, it becomes, so this is another way of asking basically what's the conjugate base uh, of, of uh, bicarbonate, and that is carbonate. So when it acts as an acid, then we're saying that it's giving up its hydrogen. Uh, so if it's giving up its hydrogen, it's becoming carbonate. All right, which should be the strongest base? So the strongest base. Going to how are we going to do this? Um, how are we going to decide this? What kind of strategies did you use? Can anybody tell me here, or how did you, how did you think through this question? Anybody? Yeah. Anybody want to participate there? Okay. Guess not. Um, all right. So we're, we're going to look at a couple things here. Uh, if you think about um, base strength, the strongest base is going to be the one that can um, have the, we'll say, the least stabilized. Charge. Did my video just go away? I don't see it anymore. Okay. Anyway, um, so the least stable, least stabilized negative charge. Okay. Thanks, Kimmy. Uh, so least stabilized negative charge is going to be the one that is on the smallest atom and least resonance stabilized. So here we've got two choices to make. We got to make the choice between S and O. So in this case, the strongest base is going to be the least stabilized. Sulfur is much bigger and can always stabilize that negative charge better than oxygen. So we would cross these out, right? Because sulfur can better stabilize that negative charge. So those are weaker bases. OK. So then we've got two more to look at here. Um, we've got as, like an acetate type ion versus an uh, ethoxide type ion. And between these two, we're going to say that the, um, the strongest base has to be the ethoxide. And the reason is because this 
uh, this one over here is stabilized by resonance, right? If we we've we've seen that before in acetate, that that negative charge is actually really shared between those two oxygens. Um, so the right answer here is D. So any questions about that one? All right. Thank you. Okay, so on to number three, a cyanide ion is both a nucleophile and a Lewis base. Um, so A and D don't make any sense because those are opposites, but B and C are always the case, no matter what the, the specific um, atom is. A nucleophile is always a Lewis base and an electrophile is always a Lewis acid. That's just the definition of those things. So then uh, on to number four, which is chiral. Um, so let's talk about the ones that are definitely not chiral first. We know uh, that A is definitely not going to be chiral because uh, there's no stereocenters at all. There's no, no chirality there at all. The others are all, all have stereocenters. But the question is, which is chiral? So only one of those can be chiral. Um, did anybody figure out which one it is? All right, I'm not hearing anybody. So it's C. Um, C is chiral. And the reason for that is that B and D, well, okay, so let's go with B first. B has two stereocenters, but it's a meso compound because um, it's symmetrical around the middle. So it has that, that um, bilateral symmetry. D, uh, D is a chiral because this is not a, actually a stereocenter. And the reason that we know that it's not actually a stereocenter is because if you try to find to pick priorities, okay, so this is going to be number one priority. The hydrogen is definitely the number two priority, but that, or sorry, the number four priority. But then between these two carbons, they're identical because you, you know you go one more past them, both get to the same place. So there's no there's no way you can make a priority between those two. Um, so no stereocenters there. So no stereocenters in A, no stereocenters in D. There are two stereocenters in B, but it's a meso compound. So it doesn't have, its mirror image would be the same thing. Um, C is the only one that has that non-superimposable mirror image and that makes it chiral. Any questions about any of those? Okay, so now I gotta figure out because I can't see the other side. So. Okay. All right, so take a couple minutes now and um, try the next, the, the rest of the page, five through seven, and then we'll go through those. Also, if you have any questions, um, if, if your audio doesn't seem to be, working, you can check to make sure that it's not muted. And also, if, if it's not working or you don't wanna use it at all, there's the chat window, so you can you can type in questions there. Um, and if you're having a lot of technical difficulties and you can't seem to get to anything, um, I've got my email open also. So send me an email with uh, whatever's going on. And we'll see if we can get it figured out.
Can you um, uh, put in the chat, like just say done or something when you're done with those questions? I it's hard for me to tell because I can't see what anybody's doing, so I don't know how long to wait. <laughs> Okay, I got a couple couple ready messages. Um, the rest of you need more time, or you're just not not typing in. Okay, all right, thank you. Which side of the reaction is favored? So this is another acid base question. Um, whatever side is favored is going to be the one with the weakest acids and the weakest bases. Um, so in this case. Uh, so this would be one where you could maybe figure this out, but it would be really helpful to have a pKa table. Um, so we know that uh, acetic acid pKa is around 4.76. We've seen that one a bunch. Um, ammonium, so that's what we're going to compare to, the pKa of this versus the pKa of ammonium. Um, I'm blanking on that one for a second, so let me... Look that up. I will I will give you a PKA table with the exam. All right, so ammonium ion is by itself is around 9.3. So we'll say this is around nine because it's an alkyl ammonium, it might be a little bit different. Um, but either way, there's clearly a difference here. The ammonium is a much weaker acid than the acetic acid. And so that means that the product side is favored. So we're always going toward the weaker acid. This is a tricky, a little bit of a tricky question because we often think about charges as being like less stable. And so to say, oh, it's going to go toward the charged area, um, you know, that doesn't seem natural. But in this case, it is because that charged ammonium species actually ends up being a weaker acid, more stable than the um, than the acetic acid. Okay, uh, which molecule reacts with water and sulfuric acid? So the um, um, acid catalyzed hydration, the fastest. 
So what's controlling this fastest? So what controls the kinetics of this type of a reaction? It's going to be the carbocation formation. So carbocation formation, whatever is going to form the more stable carbocation, that's what controls the rate. Um, so in this case, that's going to be B, right? Because that first step of the reaction, forms a tertiary carbocation. Um, a would form a primary, C a secondary, and D a secondary. So um, B is going to be the fastest forming uh, uh, reaction. Okay, looking at a hydrogenation reaction. So we're going to hydrogenate this, um, this molecule. And we have to think about the stereospecificity, sorry, uh, of hydrogenation. Um, so hydrogenation always gives the cis product so it, it'll give a mixture of both of them but in that case that might be something like this so then we can look and say okay is that going to be chiral or not and then why um, in this case it does have a stereo center. It has two stereo centers. Those are, um, so here and here are actually different. Uh, those are stereo centers. But is it chiral or not? Well, in this case, it is not. It is achiral because it has a plane of symmetry. So this is another meso compound. If you try to draw the enantiomer of this or the mirror image of this, you end up with the same thing, the same molecule. So that makes it a chiral. All right. Uh, questions on any of those? Okay. Is somebody trying to say something? It is not the anti-addition, no. Um, hydrogenation is sin addition. Not anti-addition. So, Irina, are you trying to talk? It, I can hear something, but I can't understand it. So I don't know if that's just an internet issue or what. Um, but thank you for typing in your question. Yeah. So hydrogenation. Okay. Thanks. So hydrogenation is a syn addition. Um, the only anti addition that we looked at is the um, bromination. So like Br2, well, X2 in general, Cl2, uh, those are anti additions. Hydrogenation is a syn addition. Okay. On to two. So same thing. Um, go ahead and work through that first column, and then we'll go through it together.
All right, how's it going? More time? Okay, thanks. Uh, yep, we'll talk about it. All right. Which alkene reacts with HCl to yield 2 chloro 2 methyl pentane? So I would first just like try to figure out what that actually is um, so that we can so we know like which one of these reacts with HCl to yield 2 chloro 2 methyl pentane. Okay. So there's 2 chloro 2 methyl pentane. And uh, having that drawn out, I think, makes it a little bit clearer what's going to happen here. Um, so both of these actually can do that, right? Because both of them, it's going to be regioselective to the more substituted carbon. So in this case, it's here. In this case, here is the more substituted one. That's the same position. So actually, both of these questions are going, or both of these uh, structures are going to lead to the same product. All right. So now this is the one um, that uh, I think, Nicole, you said you had trouble with. Um, I'm sure you're not the only one. All right. So this time, we have a double reaction. We have two subsequent steps. So one thing happens first, and then the other thing happens second. Another way that we would sometimes write this, so this is a totally okay way to do it, by the way, but we have also looked at it like this, two numbered steps. So in this case, what, what's happening is the, um, the first step is deprotonating the alkyne, right? deprotonating the hydrogen here. And then the second step is reacting with, so, if we do that, then we're we're essentially methylating this, so we're adding the methyl group here um, through a substitution reaction. Uh, so that product is C. The A and B choices here are meant to kind of trip you up and make you think that the NH2 is somehow adding to the alkyne, but um, it's just used as a base to deprotonate the alkyne. Okay. And then uh, increasing leaving group ability. So here, remember, when we're talking about a vertical column, the biggest effect generally is the size. The bigger the size, the more that, um, that negative charge can be stabilized. So we're going to go this. Uh, well, here, let's do it this way. I, iodine is the best leaving group. Then bromide. bromide chloride, and fluoride. So that's going to be our general order. So in that case, that is increasing leaving ability is going to be 4, then 1, then 3, then 2. So 4, 1, 3, 2. Remember, be careful about multiple choice questions like this, because you have to interpret the question properly. Um, because you'll notice that D is the exact opposite. So even if you totally understood this question and you just put them in the order of decreasing ability instead of increasing ability, you'd get the wrong choice. On a free response question, I can look at that and go, okay, I know that you kind of knew the order. You just flipped it around or, you know, you drew, you drew your um, greater than, less than signs differently. But on a multiple choice question, that's all there is. So make sure you read that carefully so that you can you can answer the right one. Um, yeah, so Nicole asks, uh, is, so it's based off atomic size and not electronegativity or anything like that. Yes, uh, atomic size, so electronegativity only can be used to answer this in if, they're, if atoms are in the same row, because that makes them similarly sized. The size effect is so much greater that when you're looking down a column, or like in, in wildly different parts of the periodic table, size is generally going to be that bigger, um, a bigger factor. So only when you're looking across the periodic table, like, like left to right. So like 
um, oxygen is going to be generally a better leaving group than nitrogen with a negative charge. Um, that's where that, that comes in. All right, so um, take a look at the next column. So that would be 11 through 13. And then let me know when you're done.
All right, it looks like it's done. Uh, anybody else? We're still going. I don't want to rush anybody. You can take your time. It's just that when we're in person, it's easy to see who's who's done and who's not. So. Okay. All right. Um, okay. To an SN2 reaction. So that's going to be. There we go. Uh, so the rate limiting step involves the alkyl halide and the nucleophile. The order of reactivity is methyl primary tertiary secondary from fastest to slowest. The rate limiting step involves only the alkyl halide, and there's an intermediate carbocation. So um, let's go back and think about the SN2 mechanism here. The mechanism is that the nucleophile and the electrophile come together at the same time. So the rate depends on both of them. Uh, so that makes one true. Two. That is also true because of steric hindrance. So the more crowded the substrate is, the more crowded the halide is, the slower the SN2 reaction will be. Um, three is not true because the rate limiting step also includes the nucleophile. So one and three are basically opposite. So those can't both be true. And then four is not true. Uh, there is no intermediate carbocation in the SN2 reaction. So A is the best answer. All right, increasing reactivity of nucleophiles. Um, so charged nucleophile is going to be more, uh, more nucleophilic or more reactive than a neutral nucleophile in general. And this is where we can deal with that electronegative Electro electronegativity issue that, um, in general, uh, the negative charge is going to be more stabilized on oxygen than nitrogen. So nitrogen is usually going to be a stronger nucleophile than oxygen. Um, so that means that our strongest nucleophile here is probably going to be three. Then four. Then one, and then water being the weakest nucleophile. So that looks like C. All right, and then looking at number 13. Um, so which of the following are likely to be SN2 reactions? We've got... So we've got four reactions here, um, all involving different alkyl halides. So let's think about the factors that are most likely to lead to SN2 reactions. So we did this in the notes. Um, we're going to look for less hindered substrates. Right, that favors SN2. Strong nucleophiles favors SN2. Um, and then also aprotic solvents. So let's see where we have that. Um, so for number one, we have a primary substrate, a strong nucleophile, and an aprotic solvent. So that's certainly SN2. For number two, we've got a secondary substrate, so that can kind of go either way. Um, but we've got a weak nucleophile and a protic solvent, so that's almost certainly SN1. It's actually a, a terrible SN1 reaction also because you'd have an ethanol nucleophile and water as a solvent, but water can also be a nucleophile, so that would just form a whole mess of products. Um, that, would be, that would be terrible. Uh, so this one, we have a hindered tertiary substrate with a good SN2 nucleophile and an aprotic solvent. Um, so this one, this one could be tricky. I would say this is still likely to go SN1 because of that tertiary substrate. 
even though we have a strong nucleophile, it's a very hindered, it's, you know, like think about your cyclohexane chair conformations that SCH3 would have to kind of get in underneath that ring, highly hindered. I think that's unlikely to be SN2. Four, we have now another primary substrate, um, a strong nucleophile and an aprotic solvent. So that's that the ones here that are meant to, that are most likely to be SN2 are going to be one and four. Um, which is that a choice over here? Sorry, we split pages here. Yeah. Move my windows over here for a second. Um, so D is probably the best answer there. So probably the trickiest part of that one is this number three, um, because if you're only looking at the subs, if you're only looking at the um, reagents and the solvents, it kind of looks like SN2. Um, but we know that highly hindered tertiary substrates not going to undergo SN2 reactions very readily. Uh, so, so make sure that you're looking at all of them. And just like it says in the book, the substrate is really the first thing you want to look at. The substrate, um, if it's if it's primary, it's not going to be SN1. If it's tertiary, it's probably not going to be SN2. Um, and so that's that's kind of your good first clue as to what's going to happen. All right, so um, take a look now at the next, the next set, and then we'll, we'll go through those together.
All right, uh, I got a couple, or I, I can't, one one done message. I, can I assume other people? Part two, or not yet? Okay. All right. The reaction of a tertiary alkyl halide with sodium iodide should mainly give what type of reaction pro product? So a tertiary alkyl halide Sodium iodide. What do you think? Anybody want to throw in a guess? It's in one, E2. Somebody's got me on a speaker or something. Oh, I hear you. Okay, should be good. Um, okay, so this one, so everybody's guessing SN one. Um, I think that's probably, I think that's probably fair. Yeah, uh, that I think that's the best answer here too. Um, I think SN two will compete a little bit here, depending on the substrate, just because iodide is not that big. But the 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 better answer here, yes, is e, uh, B SN one. You have a tertiary substrate, so that's going to be most likely. Um, I think that the reason that the elimination reactions here are less likely now SN1 and E1 are always in competition right so it's actually this is this is really not a great question um because there's there's some different right answers this is, this would be a bad bad question on a test but there's um you know you could kind of go either way because SN1 and E1 are always in competition it's likely not going to be E2 because the base isn't strong enough So iodide is a pretty weak base. So um, so we probably aren't going to see E2 reactions, um, probably SN1. And, and, and it is a good nucleophile. I, I is a good nucleophile. So SN1 is probably the best answer. But honestly, I think you could kind of make an argument for SN2 or E1 here too. So that, that's what makes it not a great, great question. Major product from an elim el elimination reaction starting with two bromopentane. So two bromopentane is here. And if we undergo elimination, E1 or E2, there's two possible products. We eliminate toward the middle or we eliminate toward the outside. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. There's actually a third product as well. There's the cis product. So we're looking for what is the most stable um, alkene. And the rules we use for that are first, the most substituted alkene. So the most carbon attached is going to be favored over one with less carbon attached. Um, so that means not this one. Between cis and trans, trans is a little bit more stable than cis. So that's the best answer here. Um, I think I think this is also an okay answer because realistically you are going to get a mixture of cis and trans. Um, again, that's not major product. It does say major product, so the most favored product is likely to be um, trans to pentene. All right, increasing reactivity in SN2 reaction. So what are we looking for here primarily? Like what's what's the factor that will give this 
the the highest reactivity in in the uh, acetone with Ki in an SN two reaction. What do you think? Yep, exactly. Who is that? Are, you can stay anonymous if you want, but one three one two two. I don't I don't know who you are. Oh, hey, Lena. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so the primary carbon. That's okay. It's fine. Uh, the primary carbon is correct. The primary carbon has the fastest rate of SN two reaction. So here you have a tertiary carbon. Here you have secondary. Here you have another secondary. All right. So the primary carbon is is going to be the most reactive. Um, the least reactive then is number three, the tertiary carbon. And then in between, we've got our secondaries. So we know that one is going to be the most react. What is it? Increasing reactivity? Yeah. So we know that one is going to be the most. And we know that three is going to be the least. What are we going to do in between here? How, um, how are we going to judge the other two in between? Um, the other two, since we have, since they're both secondary substrates on the same molecule, essentially, you can assume that there's really only one difference between them, which is what? Yeah, right, exactly. The difference between the CL and the BR. So the different leaving groups. Um, so what's a better leaving group, CL or BR? How, well, let's say, how are we judging that? So we either have a chloride leaving group or a bromide leaving group. And somebody said in the chat, the major difference there is the size, right? Chloride is smaller than bromide, bromide. So that makes bromide the better leaving group. Right? Better able to stabilize that negative charge by spreading it out over its large size. So if bromine is a better leaving group, that means that its SN2 rate is going to be faster. So our order should be three, two, four, one. And that is D. Questions about that one? Yes, Jasmine, that's correct. Larger size is more stable. So the more stable leaving group means it's going to leave more easily. Um, so we're saying, by, by saying that larger size is more stable, we're saying that the bromide is gonna leave more easily than the chloride would. So the reaction with the bromide is going to be faster than the reaction with the chloride. It's not that the, it's not that the whole neutral molecule is more stable. It's that when it leaves, it's more stable. So it's more likely to leave. Yeah. All right. Moving on, same thing. Uh, go ahead and give these a try. And then we will go through them.
All right, looks like a couple people are done. Where do I have my pen? Okay. Let's take a look. Uh, what type of solvent will promote SN1 over SN2 reactions and why? So we're looking for SN1 over SN2. Um, so that's going to be a polar product because it can stabilize both the cat carbocation intermediate and the leaving group. Um, up an A product solvent, as we talked about, can't stabilize the leaving group very well. So then it tends not to dissociate. Okay. Which reactions proceed following an E2 mechanism? So an E2 mechanism, what's going to favor that? Um, the biggest thing for an E2 is strong base. So if we have a very strong base, then we are likely, then the E2 mechanism is likely to happen before anything else, assuming that it has those hydrogens that it can deprotonate. So, um, so number one, oh, and the other thing that, that favors E2 is going to be high temperature, um, but the base is still going to be most important. So like number one and number two, I would say they are not going to be E2 because neither one of those has a particularly strong base. Uh, methyl is like a weak nucleophile, right? Nu uh, neutral, essentially. So those are going to be um, very slow to deprotonate or to, so, so we're looking at SN1, SN2, or SN1, E1 in those cases. Um, number three, there we go. There's our nice strong base. Um, it's also big. Which means that it's not going to be able to compete SN2 very easily. So that's really like your classic E2 conditions right here. You've got a big, strong base um, in relatively high temperatures. So D is probably the best answer here. Oh, there was only one thing. Okay. Um, did anybody get a chance to try this one yet? Zoom it out on the wall a little bit. Okay. Uh, why don't you give, let's see, 19 and 20 and 21 a try. And then we'll go through those. To prepare it to start.
All right, we got about uh, 10 minutes left, so I know these these take a little bit longer, but I want to go through them while um, while we have the time and then we'll finish the rest of this on Wednesday. Um, so Wednesday, I will. I will be posting the exam uh, sometime either uh, sometime early in the morning, like before 930. Um, so you'll actually have a chance to kind of see it and then we'll still look through this. I'm not going to give you any answers during our class. But, um. I will, uh, you know, I will answer questions as normal. So, and then you'll have the day to complete that exam. Um, all right. So let's take a look at these. How would you prepare Z two butene starting from one propyne bromomethane and any other reagents required? Okay. So let's look at Z two butene. From one propyne bromomethane and whatever else required. So we we uh, talked about this a little bit when we were all together um, last week or a couple. No, it was would have been a few weeks ago because back in chapter five. 
So this is one of those questions, one of those things we've got a, a three carbon substrate here, one, two, three, and we need to add a fourth carbon and then ultimately end up with an alkene. So as we talked about before, it's often helpful to think about these things backwards. So like, how do we make an alkene from what we know so far? And the way that we make an alkene is by taking an alkyne and reducing it. Um, so we reduce it hydrogen, oops, and we talked about the special catalyst. Lindlar's catalyst, um, which is uh, a way to reduce to a, from an alkyne to an alkene instead of going all the way to the alkene, which is what our normal hydrogenation catalyst would be. Um, in the, when we get into the next chapter next week, um, we will, or in two weeks, I guess, we'll learn some other ways to make alkenes also. But for now, that's the only one. So if you have a question where it says, how do you make this alkene? Um, this is really how, that's the only way you can go. So um, it, you got elimination and you've got, all right, so then going back from this one, how do we make two butyne from uh, propyne? Well, that's our, our synthesis where We have first to deprotonate this and then to methylate it. Okay. So now it also so that's that's our necessary reagents. Let me just erase this here because to avoid uh, confusion. So that's one way you could write this kind of in the path, kind of working past that. You could also just write. The steps, once you've figured it out like that, we can write it as steps like 1, NaNH2, 2CH3Br, 3H2 Lindlar's catalyst. Um, so that's fine. It also says to write, to, to write a mechanism. So we can look. Do that. Is it over? No, I guess not. Okay. Let's see if we can do that over here. All right. So we're going to start with this. So our mechanism looks like this you deprotonate. Okay, um, NH3 is going to be our byproduct here. And then we do the substitution reaction on the CH3Br. That's a, a standard SN2 type mechanism. Gives us this. And then that last step, um, we really draw mechanisms for that. So I would I would I would have been more specific to only draw the reaction mechanism for that for that first part. Um, because we don't we don't draw the mechanisms for those those metal catalyzed ones. We're not gonna do that in this class. Um, so that's where I would leave that. Uh, and and hopefully on the exam on Wednesday, I'll be more specific. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Circle the chiral centers in the following compounds. Label each chiral center as either R or S. 
Okay, so our chiral centers here are going to be right there, right there, here. So hopefully you found those. I'm going to show. I'm going to give you the configurations of each of these. If you got something different, see if you can figure out what went wrong, or or ask. Um, you know, send a message in the chat, or unmute yourself and ask. So this should be. Um, this one should be an S, and this one is an R. Over here, we've got these are kind of tricky ones. Um, so we'll have one, two, three, R. One, two, three, S. Questions about those? Um, I'll just be honest with you for the for the exam on Wednesday. I'm not. I won't make you that are quite this complicated. The reason these are so difficult, I think, you know, when you're trying to find these tiebreakers and they're like very, very similar, that's when it gets really, really tricky. Um, yeah, the second one, you mean this one, right? So let's take a look over here. Uh, so they're all curved. So then we go one more step, which is this one. Sorry, we'll start back here. So here's the carbon that we're looking at. There's the stereo center. So first we look, yeah, let's look at how to number this one. First, let's go, there it is, okay. So first we look at the three, um, the three things that are directly right connected to it. And at first glance, those all look like ties, right? Carbon, carbon, carbon. So they're all essentially the same. So we look one carbon past that. So now we're looking at this one. This one versus this one. They're still all carbons, but now we have a carbon that's branched to three carbons versus a carbon that's branched to zero carbons. Right? That's a CH3. So we've got CH3 over here versus CH2 here versus CH here. Um, so that's where that's where we get our priorities. So that tells us that this one's going to be priority one. This is priority two. And this is priority three. So you keep going out carbon to carbon until you get the more in the whenever you see a difference where there's more branching, where there's more carbons attached, that gets the higher priority. Um, okay, so that's where we get R one, two, three, R. And that's the same idea over here. So we look over at this one, we've got one here versus here versus here. Those are all carbons. So we go out to the next one. And now this one becomes priority one. This one's priority two. And then this one's going to be three. Um, but again, yeah, I, I probably won't give you ones that are quite that fussy. Um, all right. Okay, well, we're out of time. Um, so I will I will stick around for a couple minutes in case anybody has any more questions. Um, but I don't want to take more of your time. Otherwise, uh, keep studying. Hope everything's going okay. Um, and I will uh, I'll, I'll see you on Wednesday morning and just watch for that watch for that um, thing. Sorry, I've got a phone call. It might be the school or something. Hold on a second, I'm going to take this. Sorry, it was not a big deal. So you're free to go. Um, if you want to stick around, if you have any more questions, I will be here um, for a little bit longer. Uh, so yeah, let me know if you have any questions.
Thanks, everybody. Yeah, the um the exam will be midnight. Will be due midnight.